Okie dokes. So uh, Mission Control here is actually going to do a, a small little clinic now. We had a bit of a problem because all of a sudden we found out that when I launched a PowerPoint in the computer here, um, it actually overlaid over the top of our uh, broadcasting uh, software. So we couldn't access the broadcasting software. So in a, an immediate panic, we've uh, emailed the PowerPoint presentation down to Brad, who's down in Lismore, which is about uh, two and a half, three hours drive away from uh, where I am. And he's going to drive the PowerPoint from his uh, his computer there. So uh, this, uh, yeah, I guess we'll get into it. So uh, hit the slide for the first one, Brad. Okay, so this uh, PowerPoint, this uh, presentation I'd put together uh, for the uh, convention in Kansas City a couple of years ago. So it it uh, gives a bit of an explanation about where uh, where we're from. Uh, most of the guys that you saw tonight from Australia are from Queensland and Jerry is from New South Wales. So if you see the map there, he's just a little north of Sydney and I'm just a little south of Brisbane. I'm about an hour away from Brisbane. So uh, that's a, a little picture of Australia for all the people that don't know where we actually are. Okay, hit the next one. So who am I? I live on a place called the Gold Coast. Uh, there's a little picture of the Gold Coast. That was just to tempt the people in Kansas City because they probably haven't seen beaches in a while. Um, but yes, yeah, a nice place to live. Um, it's the holiday resort, basically, of Australia. Um, a lot of overseas, a lot of Chinese, a lot of Korean uh, visitors come here as well. So I guess you can hit the next slide. And I'm a member of the NMRA down under, uh, as Duncan mentioned before. I actually used to be the uh, Div 1 Super. Till Duncan took over, I was the Div Super, I think, for about 10 years, 10 and a half years. And a uh, uh, great bunch of fellas. That, uh, a club meeting that was uh, held down in Sydney. So there's a few guys decided to have a bit of a photo out the front. But anyway, enough about me and where I'm from and what I do. Hit the next slide. Oh, I forgot to mention, I model Victorian railways. So you've seen a couple of other uh, New South Wales uh, trains lately uh, on a, a la the last couple of presentations. Well, here, here's where you'll see the classy trains. Um, they're uh, Victorian railways. I model the 1983 era. And in that era, we actually had the old uh, blue and gold, which is uh, that X-Class in that photo. Uh, they were phased out, and there was a tangerine and grey colour scheme that came in. And it's tangerine, it's not orange. So that's a little photo there of uh, Spencer Street Station in round about 1983. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I model. So we'll hit the next slide. And if you hit it again... Okay, so this this uh, clinic is not actually about uh, a uh, rustic old steam engineer in his quest to find the best baked goods around. Um, it's actually, if you hit the next slide and hit it again and again, it's actually about creating a DCC system with a Pi Sprog a Raspberry Pi 3 mini computer. So we've got a few things out there now, like Engine Driver, which is an app that runs on your Android or smartphone or tablet. And um, we used to hook those up to computers and DCC systems, and we could have a wireless uh, control system for our uh, layout at a very minimal cost because the software to run it was free. And generally, you just get somebody's old used uh, iPhone or Android phone download the software and there you didn't need a SIM card or anything in the phone or the phone to work and uh, you could use it as a wireless throttle on your layout. So if we click the button again, oh that was the other board. That, uh, so what happened is uh, our friends at Sprog, so I've hit the button again and hit it again. So uh, so in the beginning, um, I uh, always, ever since I had a DCC system, I started off many, many years ago in the early 80s with a Salada system. And that came out of Italy, and it had five decoders, and you had five knobs on the, on the controller. Each decoder was color-coded, and um, each 
dial or knob on the uh, controller was color coded. So if you turn the right control knob to the right, the the, uh, the the red control knob to the right, the red loco would take off and run. The one that had the red decoder in it. So it was very primitive. I then got a, a, a lens system, um, and then after finding out what the price is to buy parts for a lens system, I got rid of it and I bought one of the very first Digitrack systems uh, that were released. Um, I've actually got one of the old UT1 throttles here from Digitracks, and it only has four functions and two di digit addressing. So, uh, yeah, fairly old. But I always wanted to have a wireless system. Now, even now, you can buy uh, DCC systems with wireless, NCE, Digitracks, all the major brands have wireless. But they're fairly expensive. Like uh, in Australia, a Digitrax wireless throttle is going to cost you the best part of 400 to 450 Australian dollars. Um, if we do the quick uh, conversion into American dollars, that'll be probably about uh, $53.67. Uh, because the way our dollar's gone at the moment, it's not good. And a lot of these manufacturer ones don't actually show the information that you can get out of a Y throttle. So if we hit the slide again and move on to the next one. So this system used JMRI using the, uh, the mobile phones. Uh, what is JMRI? Well, I think everybody that's probably on here would know about JMRI, but we'll just have a quick rundown. It's a suite of programs that is built by model railway people for model railway people and it costs you nothing um, it started off uh, with a program called Dakota Pro um, they then added Panel Pro and since then they've had a plethora of other functions to the software um, as you heard uh, Duncan earlier on talking about his operating sessions he actually uses uh, the operations part of JMRI to generate, generate his lists and his paperwork. Uh, Jerry, who was on earlier, is a prolific installer of sound decoders in, uh, in locos for people in Australia. He's always, he's probably doing about two or three a day. He's, he's flat out at it. He, he, he went into retirement and I think he started a bigger business. Um, uh, he uses Dakota Pro extensively for setting up and tuning the locos. So uh, it's, it's a very, very, very uh, powerful piece of software. Uh, we hit the button again. And as it says there, Dakota Pro was initially uh, designed um, to do uh, programming of the locos through Dakota Pro. And in JMRI is a section called Wi-Fi Throttle. And that allows you to use a piece, an app on a mobile device. And if you click the button, I think twice, and it'll bring the text up. <clears throat> so Wi-Fi throttles is a method of controlling your trains via a mobile device, like a smartphone or a tablet PC, uh, in JMRI. Um, if you hit the button again, and you ask what a smartphone, well, a smartphone is basically one of the, any touchscreen phone apart from the Windows ones that were around a few years ago. So mainly iPhone or Android devices. But basically, if you've got a touch screen on your phone, it's most likely a smartphone. And then the tablet devices are things like iPads and iPods. Um, to give you some example, uh, on my layout at home, I don't have any control panels, but I have a number of old iPads and iPod and um, Samsung uh, tablets that are set up through Y-Throttle to actually work as, uh, as panels through the Panel Pro software. But that, that's another whole clinic on its own. So uh, we'll hit the button again and move on to the next one. So in the old days, how did we have to, if we wanted to use Wi-Fi Throttle, how, how, do, how did we do it? Well, first we needed a model railway that was connected to a DCC system of some shape or form. So there we got a picture of a, a layout and a DCC system. And if we hit the button, I think, twice, we get a computer. And if we hit it again, we get a wireless router. So we also needed a computer running JMRI. And then we needed a, a method of connecting it all up together. So we needed an interface that connected our DCC system to the computer. And then we needed a wireless access device, like the wireless router there, 
or uh, as the English people will probably be saying, router. Uh, I don't know. To me, it's a router. So, so um, we need a wireless router as well. So if we hit the button again, I think it'll bring a picture of up or what. Uh, hit it again. So a mobile device is connected to the wireless router as the PC. So the PC was connected wirelessly to the wireless router. So was the mobile device that's that's here. So if we hit the button again and again, and that gives us this little photo here. So to use this type of technology, we had to have a laptop computer running JMRI, which is in the middle there. We needed a uh, DCC system of some sort to talk to our train so we could run them. And then we needed an interface unit, which is at the bottom left-hand corner of that image showing the, uh, the interface unit connecting the computer to the, uh, to the DCC system. And then on the right, we've got our wireless router, which allowed our wireless devices to connect to the computer. So it was a lot to do. Now, if we hit the button again, and again, and maybe again. Okay, so our club, I'm involved in a club here on the Gold Coast, and one of our major things is to attend as many shows and as many uh, events as possible. As you could probably imagine, this year we've attended none because of uh, the, the problems that have been plaguing the planet. Um, our, our club members all, we, we, we sat down and said, okay, well, what uh, DCC system we're going to use on the, um, on the uh, exhibition layout that we were building? And um, someone, you know, we've got people that are model European. They've got Eulenbrock DCC. We've got others that have got uh, uh, Lens. We've got others that have got uh, Digitrax, NCE. And I think there might be one easy DCC member in the club. So... It was a bit of a fight to sort of what, what system we're going to use, but everybody had a mobile phone. So I said to them, well, look, well, you use this technology, and it just requires someone to go there and set it up all the time uh, until we can find out a way of maybe using this technology uh, a lot easier. So if you hit the button again, so that's what we were aiming for in the end. We wanted a system where you could just plug the power into the layout Start the application on your mobile phone, connect to the layout, and run trains. There, we, there had to be no setting up of a PC when we set the layout up, no setting up of JMRI, no setting up of a wireless router, no DCC system to set up either. All we wanted to do was go there, put power into the layout, pick up our phones, and be able to run trains. So we hit the button again. So this brought us onto this technology. I started having a little look around, and there was this thing called a Raspberry Pi microcomputer, or single board computers, SBCs, as some people call them. And they were developed in the United Kingdom by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and it was to promote the teaching of basic computer sciences to schools in developing countries where they can't afford to buy computer equipment. So they made this little device, and I think if you hit the button again, we might get a picture of it. There it is there. They made this little device, um, the Raspberry Pi 1. And it could run some basic functions. It had network capability. It had a HDMI output. It had a couple of USB ports, so you could connect up a keyboard and a mouse. And it ran a operating system called Linux which for all the computer fanboys out there will understand it's a, a very manipula, uh, very um, user-friendly software for developers, and it's all free. So you can build your own applications to run in Linux and the likes, and uh, it's a, lot, uh, a lot of people use it instead of using Windows or a Mac. So I got my first Raz Pi about three years ago when they first came out. And I had one of these Sprog 2 DCC units. And if we hit the button again, I think we'll see a picture of a Sprog 2. And that's what a Sprog 2 looked like. It had a USB plug at the bottom. So I could plug that into the laptop and then plug that into the track and run the layout. But it still required taking a laptop and a computer. Well, you have gone a bit far there. If you right click and, and hit previous, you might go back to the... There we go. 
So, yeah, so um, it was still a bit hand-drawlic. There was still stuff that uh, our club members would have to set up. Now, a couple of the guys in our club are in their, you know, in their 70s. They're not computer savvy. They want something very simple. So even this solution didn't really cut the mustard with us. But I must admit the Sprog 2 is a brilliant device for uh, your little programming track in your workshop to run. Uh, I do a, a clinic on um, the Sprog 2 and how I use it, but again, that's another clinic, and I'm not going to uh, diversify or, or get drawn away. So hit the button again, and we'll move on to the next slide. How are we doing for time? Oh, we're plodding along there. Okay, hit the button again, and again. That'll do. Okay, so... Sprog said, okay, we've got this device called a Raspberry Pi, which is a little microcomputer. And we make a programmer that connects you by USB to, um, to uh, uh, computers. So why don't we make a board that plugs in by the internal GPIO port, which we'll get into in a little later, and it turns the Raspberry Pi into a DCC system. So they brought out two boards, the Pi Sprog 1 and the Pi Sprog Nano. The Pi Sprog Nano was never really accepted and is probably, I don't think, available anymore. Uh, the Pi Sprog 1, uh, I bought one of these about three years ago uh, and took it to the narrow gauge, Australian Narrow Gauge Convention. And next minute I had people wanting me to want to know where they could buy them from, and no one in Australia sold them. So uh, a couple of email messages here and there, and next minute I was buying Pi Sprog 1s and um, assembling them and loading them up with the software and sending them out. So uh, there's probably about 320 of them, I think, now in Australia. So anyway, next slide. Ah, give it, that's it, older there. Now, so we've been talking about the earlier Raspi's. I started off with the Raspi 1. Well, they released a couple of new models. As, as um, This uh, technology was not only being used by model railroaders, but the maker community was using it quite extensively to run 3D printers and uh, 3D CNC machines and the likes. Um, the uh, robot people were using it quite a bit for um, their onboard PC on the, in robots. So Raspberry Pi Foundation released the Raspberry Pi Model B. Now the big difference between this guy and the previous ones is this one now has inbuilt Wi-Fi. So we can now load the Raspberry Pi up with JMRI, which has our free software in it that allows us to use a mobile phone to drive our trains, and we've got a board that we could plug into the top of, uh, top of this to give us a 2.5 amp DCC output. We've now got a complete computer, wireless network, and DCC system all in one pack. So if we hit the next button... We'll have a little look at how we put it all together. So we'll go over a Raspberry Pi first and um, and just uh, uh, look at the ports and bits and pieces we have. So at the back, that big pin header is called the General Purpose Input-Output Port, or GPIO port, and that's what talks to the Sprog board. We've got a micro SD card reader, which sits down the bottom there, which contains all the program. There's no hard drive or anything like that in this device. The power connection is by our little 5 volt DC phone adapter that uh, we can plug in. So a 2.5 amp uh, 5 volt um, power supply will work quite well. On the other side there, we've got four USB ports. Uh, they are USB 2. We also have an Ethernet connection, so we can connect this up to your router of your home network and use it to surf the net. Um, we also have an audio line output, so we can take the audio out, and we have a HDMI connection, so we can connect up a monitor. So using the USB ports and the HDMI connector, we could actually just plug this straight into a monitor keyboard mouse, and we've got a fully functioning computer there. Uh, so how do we put it together? So if we hit the next button... And the next button. Okay, so we just... Oh, go back, go back. You jump, jump the gun. 
So we all we do is plug the Pi Sprog board into the GPIO header, and that's our DCC system and our PC all assembled and built. Couldn't be easier, could it? Anyhow, let's have a look at the next slide. Now you can move forward. So hit 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 the next button and the next one. So software, now go back. Go back again. So the next thing to do is insert the micro SD card into the reader and you're ready to power it up, start loading the program. And everyone screams, ah, software, configuring software. If you hit the button on the PowerPoint, and again, okay. So if you buy a uh, board or a complete system from uh, Sprog in the UK, or Sprog uh, in um, the USA, or off myself, you can also buy a pre-configured SD card, which will have you up and running within two seconds. It already has JMRI loaded. It already has the Linux operating system loaded. It already has a remote control piece of software on there loaded, which we're going to look at in a minute, because I'm going to try and do a live demo and connect to a Raspberry Pi. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, you can either set it up yourself or you can buy it already configured. So that way, no software to configure at all. Hit the button again. Just insert the SD card, power up the Raspberry Pi, connect it to your mobile device, and you're done. Start engine driver and start enjoying running trains. So if we hit the button again. So... Now we put the thing together. It looked a bit odd, just two circuit boards stacked on top of each other. So we thought, okay, what am I going to do with the case? So I thought we're going to have to do something here. So if you hit the button again and again. Okay, so I've got a 3D printer at home and I bought that thinking that I was going to sit down and learn how to run CAD software and draw up all these miracle models and start assembling them and like probably about 80% of the people who buy 3D printers, it's sitting in the back room there with about an inch of dust over it. Uh, and basically all I do is I go to places like Thingiverse and find projects I like and then just print them. So I had a little look around. Uh, there was plenty of th uh, cases for, um, for uh, Raspberry Pis. Uh, but the problem was is getting the board on the top. Um, so the standard cases didn't fit. So I found this guy on uh, Thingiverse and printed it out, and it seemed to work well. Then people wanted me to make them for them, and it took me about three days to print each one of these cases out. So if you hit the button again, I found an acrylic case that's been CNC machined uh, online, and I started buying those cases. So that's what the Raspberry Pi looks like in its uh, in its form. So uh, those then we've mounted into um, different layouts in our club. Um, now you can stay there, that's fine. I've uh, mounted those into layouts in our club. Our modular layout's got one built in. So we go to shows now. There's one power socket on the layout once we've clipped all the modules together. You plug that in, go get a cup of coffee, come back, get your mobile phone out. All the members' phones are pre-configured to automatically access the Raspberry Pi and bang, they're off and running trains. And we've used that system now at uh, the shows that we attend for probably the last two and a half, three years. And we've had a couple of, we had a couple of problems one pl at uh, one stage, but um, we, we've got those licked, I think, now. Uh, now, there's a bunch of links on the page. So if you want to buy the stuff yourself and you want to set it up yourself, because, again, this is all meant to be DIY DCC. There are all the links you will need to buy the bits and pieces or download the various apps that, uh, that we'd, we'd, we'd need. And um, if you're in the UK, you can buy the Sprog board and the uh, pre-formatted SD card from Sprog DCC. Say g'day to Andrew if you do and tell him you found it from this convention. And if you're in the USA and you want to buy one, you can buy them from the BBM group. 
Uh, and uh, anybody else anywhere in the world, uh, you can also buy them off me. So, uh, yeah, we'll hit the next slide. Oh, okay, in the press, uh, YouTube model builders have a series of magazines that I believe you can still get access to. And a year, two years ago, uh, in the June issue, there was a whole magazine on uh, microelectronics for your model railway. Uh, so there's an article in there on the Sprog, on how you can build the Sprog. So if you're after those links and the likes, you can always get those there. Or you can get a copy of this PowerPoint. We might have that available somewhere soon. It might pop up on the AML clinics page, maybe. We'll see what happens. We'll see if we can talk uh, the evil overlord into uh, placing it upon, upon there. Okay, next uh, button and the next button on top. So here's my old mate Freud, and he's asking, is there any questions? So... Um, uh, are you going to read the chat, Brad, or? Yeah, I'll have a look. Um, no. Oh, yeah, there is. Can you run more than one Sprog Pi on the layout? And can you change the wireless IP address for the Pi? Uh, well, you wouldn't need to run more, one, more than one Sprog Pi. If you needed more power, the Sprog Pi will give you 2.5 amps. If you needed more power you can uh, attach them to any kind of booster. So if you had an old NCE booster sitting out the back, you could use that, and then you could make your um, Spry Pi Sprog system a 5-amp uh, uh, or whatever that system is, and you, then you can also daisy-chain the boosters. So you could take the output out of the Pi Sprog and then daisy-chain it to the, uh, to the boosters. Okay. Uh... Is the Pi Sprog a direct replacement for a conventional DCC system, say, such as Lens or Digitrax? I would not use... Uh, I My layout at home is run by a Digitrax um, system. Um, I've, As I said, I've been involved. I've had Digitrax since the late 80s. Uh, and um, as Duncan said before, you make an investment in those, in those systems and uh, you kind of stay with them. Where I see the uh, Pog, uh, Sprog Pi systems coming into their own is um, people doing, one, exhibitions or clinics. Uh, Jerry Hopkins, who was on before, has bought one and he uses it now for his clinics. So all he takes is his, is his uh, laptop that he can connect wirelessly to the Sprog and his piece of test track, and, um, and he's off and racing. So uh, the other use for him is like we do in our club. We have um, uh, a number of exhibition layouts, so we have Pi Sprogs built into each exhibition layout. That means when we go to a show, we just plug the layout in and, and off it goes. Glenn's asked... Uh... Does the Pi Sprog have the ability to connect a NCE QSnap into the system? Uh, the QSnap, I believe, is the snap switch uh, controller, which runs on the rail bus. So, yes, the Pi Sprog could power one of those. Okay. Uh, let me just scroll through. The next question, the Pi runs on 5 volts, but the track runs on 12 to 16 volts. Does this mean that there's two power supplies needed? That's correct. You have a 5-volt power supply to run the um, Raspberry Pi board itself. And then on the terminal block on the Sprog board, you have a 12-volt, 2.5-amp DC input, and then you have two pins that then go out to your track supply. Uh, Robert's asked... Uh, can you use this for programming track setup? You Not certainly yeah. you certainly can. I've sold a few of these where people have had uh, their layouts either under the house or in a shed out the back, and then they've had a little workshop in, in the house, and they've bought a Raspi Sprog uh, and just set that up on their little bit of test track on their workshop and then just plugged in a keyboard, mouse, and a HDMI monitor, and they've had a... a, 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 a a fully functioning uh, JMRI system that they can program their locos, they can program their decoders, they can 
save their roster entries in there and archive them. Okay. Can you just uh, explain the three different ways that this system can be used? So you've touched um, briefly on the headless system that your club use for display layouts. Can you just run us through the other two options that the Pi offer? Okay, well, with the Raspberry Pi, um, it has uh, in the preload, in, in the SD cards that the, we sell the, and the manufacturer sells, um, it has a copy of a program called VNC. So when you actually power your Pi up, the VNC will automatically wirelessly be looking for any computers that have got that VNC software running on it. Um, once it does, uh, it, you can then connect your laptop computer to the Raspberry Pi through VNC uh, Viewer, and you can see the desktop of the Raspberry Pi uh, on the VNC Viewer. Um, if you wanted to, we could we could risk life and limb and see whether we can actually... I've got a Raspberry Pi powered up here, and I'll show you how that system works. And, of course, the other way is having a keyboard mouse plugged in so you can, uh, you can directly control it, and then the other way is running it headless, as, as we said before. So let's see if I can get VNC to work. So... Uh, Just while you're attempting that, there's a couple in the, the chat of asking what sort of dollars here in Australia that they're worth. I'm guessing the best way is to shoot you an email. Yep. Yeah, send us an email. Uh, they're round about, the, it depends on what the dollar is at the time when I get the boards, but they're round about the 250 mark, 270 with a, uh, with a power supply. And that's in South, South Pacific dollars. So again, it'll probably be about forty-three dollars sixty-seven in US dollars. Yeah, okay. look, these, these are a good system. Like just while you're getting that loaded, I actually run one personally on my own layer, um, and I log in via VCN. And yeah, I really can't fault it. I've pretty much done away with my lens system for the same issues or reasoning that you mentioned is the cost of parts and probably the lack of modernization that uh, Lens had in the last five years. So, yeah, definitely a good alternative to, to some of the other um, mainstream DC systems that are out there. Okay, so if I maximise, if I maximise that, there we go. So that is the desktop of the Raspberry Pi. So we're now connected wirelessly to one of the devices I got on the other side of the room that's actually powered up, and, um, and we've just connected straight in here. So you can see there's JMRI already running, and it's already set up to start up the Wi-Fi throttle. So now all we have to do is start a mobile phone, connect it, and it would appear in here, and we can start driving trains. But as you see, it is a full version of... Uh, decoder of JMRI so we can go to the roster there shouldn't be anything oh there is stuff in here look at that that's a bonus and we can maximize it so there's all the roster in there of all uh, you know, these high quality Victorian railway stuff V line I don't know why there's an Amtrak there that that must be a spelling mistake but anyway um, so there's there's the JMRI roster where you can set up a new loco and all the all the rest of it uh, just as you would do on any other computer running JMRI. Uh, you can run Panel Pro as well. So um, if we wanted to, we could, uh, we could open up panels. Uh, let me see. Being as the roster's there, let me see if this panel will actually open. Here we go. Now I'm going to crash the system completely. Okay, so it was a demo board I was working on, but there's the panel. Now, if this was actually connected to a system, I could control the points just by clicking the elements here. Or if I output this via the web server to a tablet, you could just touch the elements in the drawing and the points would change. So, yeah, you're, uh, you, you could use this device to set up JMRI. You could write panels in this inside save them, put them on a, uh, 
USB stick and then bring them out to your, your layout in the shed and then apply them to your uh, JMRI in the layout of the shed. So let me see if I can close this without crashing everything. Okay. <clears throat> but as you can see by the desktop of the Raspberry Pi, it's very much like using a Windows machine. Uh, control, paste, cut, copy, they all work same in here as it does in Windows. Um, it is Linux software, so it is not Windows, but it has, it's, if you can run a Windows computer or an Apple computer, you can run a Linux computer. It's just learning a little bit different terminology. Okay. So any more questions there? Well, I think that's pretty much all for the, the Pi itself. There is a couple more. Um, now, this is a plug. This is a bit of my question. This is a plug and play system. So there's no soldering, 1L, 2Ls, any of that? No, definitely no soldering. Perfect. Yep. Uh, the only other question out of the, uh, the chat our good mate Rod over in Western Australia asked and he wondered what the temperature was like over at your place, Martin. Oh, the temperature, that, well, at the moment, being as it's now two minutes to nine, uh, it's still a little bit tepid outside. I still have the air conditioner running in the shed at the moment. So, But then again, I do come from South Wales in the UK, so you know anything above about 10 degrees is hot for me. Perfect. I think that's um, about all the questions that I can see here. So if you've got anything else to add, I think we might wrap this one up. Not a problem. I'll, uh, I'll uh, now duck out of this, take this cap off, and uh, I think we've got our next presenter waiting to get in the room. So we'll go for a little intermission break. So everybody fill your cup of coffee up, go get more popcorn, and uh, and we'll uh, see you in a little while.